We are delighted tonight not to have two wonderful speakers talk to us about a very important topic. And we have a terrific audience on a Monday night. So we have Maya Rockamore Cummings, who is the founder and CEO of Global Policy Solutions. And she is the author of the Political Action Net Handbook, a how-to guide for the hip-hop generation. <coughs> and she also has another important, uh, she's chair of another very important uh, uh, organization in Maryland, but I think we're not going to dwell on that uh, to, tonight, uh, keeping our nonpartisan flag up. And then our other, uh, other speaker is Tiffany Boyman, who is a commissioner for the, uh, the uh, Commission on, for Women in Montgomery County. So uh, without further ado, we will, we will give you the speaker to, uh, the mic to, uh, who wants to start off? Oh, we're gonna have, we're gonna have Commissioner Boyman start off. Her PowerPoint slides are up and ready, and then we'll turn it, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Mrs. Cummings, Maya Cummings, and then we'll open it up for questions. So here you go. Can everybody here. So thanks so much to everybody for showing up on a windy Monday. I'm kind of a is it up? Okay. Seems to go in and out a little bit. Um, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for inviting me to join you here tonight to talk about the Status of Women report that we put out in January of this year. I'm thrilled to be able to talk about the findings with you. Um, so I want to thank the League for the opportunity to do that. And it's also an honor to share the program with Dr. Cummings. So I was thrilled all around to be here with you tonight. So as uh, many of you know, um, my topic tonight will be talking through some of the key findings from the Status of Women report that we put out on the same day as our women's legislative briefing, um, with a particular emphasis on places where we see disparities, particularly racial disparities. Before we do that, I want to just give you kind of a quick background on the commission for those of you who aren't familiar. We were established in 1972. Um, and actually, next slide, please. Um, as an advisory board to and a department of county government. Uh, basically, our mandate is to advise the county executive, the county council, and other stakeholder groups on issues concerning women in Montgomery County. We're a 15-person uh, volunteer advisory panel, of which uh, I'm one of the volunteer commissioners, uh, and we have one full-time executive director. I also want to give you a little bit of background on who I am. Um, I'm kind of a self-described data nerd who joined the commission in 2017, and I spent a lot of time studying women's employment data in my day job. So when I was applying to the commission and discovered their 2007 Status of Women report, I thought it was really a rich and insightful glimpse into women's experiences and challenges in the county. And so when I joined the commission, I was thrilled that other members had similar enthusiasm for reissuing the report. Uh, I do want to say, while it was a mammoth undertaking for the commissioners, uh, it just simply would not have been possible to do the data analysis that we did without the support of the county stat team uh, that's employed by the county. It's a group of statisticians and data analysis, and they did all the data runs for us uh, that you'll see in the slides that follow. So I, I do want to say a, a thank you in absentia to all the data analysts for the county who helped us with this report. Next slide. So uh, very quickly, what we do as a commission, there's really three main pillars to the commission's approach, education and outreach, advocacy, and some limited direct service. And this report supports and informs both our education and outreach activities uh, and, and our advocacy work. Next slide. A little bit of background on the report itself. So in its 47 year history, the commission has issued this report three times roughly at 10 year intervals, first in 1997, in 2007, and again this year. And this iteration of the report covers many of the same kind of broad categories as the last report. I'm gonna talk a little bit about demographics and those kinds of changes, uh, women in the economy, public health, public safety, women in politics, 
And, and then uh, this year, for the first time, the county statisticians also did these deep dive looks at <coughs> poverty, quality of life, and the primary election. One of the most exciting things, actually, about this iteration of the report is that for the first time, we have moved fully into the 21st century. We have a new interactive web-based format, so the vast majority of the content and the data analysis is actually available online. We did do a summary that includes some kind of high-level findings and our recommendations, and I have several copies um, on the side table back there, so I'd encourage you um, to take a look at that and take that with you. It all, oh, we go. It also includes the link to the uh, data dashboard. And I apologize, these slides are gonna be really dense. I'm gonna throw a lot of numbers at you. Um, I realize it's kind of hard to absorb, but I really did wanna provide as much information to this group tonight as I could. But the report is this really kind of a comprehensive snapshot of how women in the county are faring on a variety of indicators uh, with numerous comparisons to the data from the last report 10 years ago. Next slide. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about key findings, and I apologize. This guy is going in and out. Uh, overall, the findings underscore a number of positive trends for women who live and work in Montgomery County. Over the last decade, women have continued to make material gains in education, in employment, earnings, political representation, and other key indicators of well-being, often outpacing national averages. But the analysis also revealed some troubling trends. Uh, and patterns that we thought really warrant further attention and study by individuals and stakeholder groups in the county. These include significant increases in the numbers of women living in poverty, racial and ethnic disparities in infant mortality rates and other health indicators, rising rates of sexually transmitted infections, sizable numbers of disconnected girls and young women, and doubled rates of domestic violence reports in the last three years. And I'm gonna drill down on a number of those in the slides that follow. Next slide, please. I wanna talk a little bit about demographics and demographic changes in the county. Women comprise more than half of Montgomery County residents, 51.7%, and over the last decade, the largest population increases occurred in the 60 to 74 age range. Also, Montgomery County is now a majority minority county with 56% of women identifying as a racial or ethnic minority, and you can see those detailed breakdowns there. And immigrants account for 33% of women and girls in the county. Montgomery County is home to over a third of the state's Hispanic women and more than 40% of the state's Asian women. And the numbers of single parent households over our last look 10 years ago have increased marginally by about 4% since 2006. But when we look at racially disaggregated data of single parent families as a percentage of the total families within that racial group, we do see a greater predominance of single parent families among African American families than other racial and ethnic <coughs> groups. In 2017, 36% of African American families in the county were led by single parents, compared with 23% of Hispanic families, 12% of white families, and 7% of Asian families. Next slide, please. The first indicator that I want to talk about is poverty. Now, the findings on women in poverty, we thought, uh, as a commission, really represented some of the starkest and most significant trends in this report. The number of women living in poverty <coughs> increased by 66% between 2007 and 2017. It's a numeric increase of 16,500 women over our last analysis 10 years ago. And in almost every age category, women comprise a significant majority of the residents living in poverty. <coughs> women of color experience higher rates of poverty than their white counterparts. African American and Hispanic women represent almost 60% of the women living in poverty in the county. I will say, despite an uptick in the numbers of women living in poverty in the county, the overall percent of women living in poverty as a share of the total population is lower than national averages. 7.7% <clears throat> of women in the county live in poverty, compared with 14.5% of women nationally. And also, as a point of comparison, it's important to note that the numbers of men living in poverty increased by about 60% over the same period. Uh, so this is a shared issue. 
you know, as I said, uh, there are racial disparities in terms of our residents living in poverty. Um, for example, while black women make up 18% of the total population of women in the county, they compose 28% of the women living in poverty. And similarly, Hispanic women make up 18% of the total population of women in the county, but 25% of women living in poverty. Also, when you look at residents suffering from chronic homelessness, 55% are black or African American. Next slide, please. So in terms of public health, the findings here are kind of a mixed bag. You know, encouragingly, birth rates among adolescents have decreased by almost half since 2010, and infant mortality rates declined between 2008 and 2014, but increased in 2015 and 2016, driven in part by rising infant mortality rates among African Americans. We also found in our analysis that breast cancer mortality rates are higher among African American women than their white counterparts, and African American and Hispanic women are twice as likely to be diagnosed with cervical cancer as their white or Asian counterparts. As many of you have probably read in the press, the rate of sexually transmitted infections among women overall has reached its highest level in a decade. Women are about 18% more likely than men to visit the emergency room for mental health related reasons and women are somewhat more likely than men to have health insurance, accounting for 45% of the residents without health insurance. But here again, we see some racial disparities. Although they don't represent this uh, percentage of the overall population, Hispanic residents overall account for 55% of residents without health insurance. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about our findings around employment and labor force participation. Women in Montgomery County who are employed full-time and year-round earn 82% of their male counterparts' wages, as compared to about 72% for a national average. Women account for 44% of the full-time civilian workforce and 40.5% of the Montgomery County government workforce, which does not include the public schools. <coughs> And despite a 12 percentage point gap in labor force participation between women and men in the county in the ages between 30 and 60, women's labor force participation remains at over 80% in these years, which is pretty high. The labor force participation rate for county mothers with children under 18 is also higher than national averages, 80% versus 73% nationally. I do want to talk about uh, some disparities, though, in terms of the gender wage gap. Similar to national trends, the gender wage gap is even more pronounced for women of color in Montgomery County. African American women earn 69 cents on the man's dollar, and Latinas earn only 47 cents on the man's dollar. Next slide, please. So what we found uh, in terms of education and educational attainment is that these indicators for women and girls in Montgomery County are largely positive. Women hold graduate degrees at almost triple the national rate, and earnings in the county for women with a graduate or professional degree are the fourth highest in the nation among counties with at least 150,000 residents. Girls are 10% more likely than boys to be enrolled in at least one AP or IB course, and on average, they outperform boys in both literacy and math. But one of the concerning things that we found in looking at this data is that girls and young women constitute half of the county's disconnected youth, with an estimated 4,800 young women between the ages of 16 and 24 not active in school or work. And when you drill down on some of this data around disconnected youth, and this is looking at youth generally, not just women and girls, black or African American youth and Hispanic youth are roughly twice as likely to be disconnected compared to white and Asian residents. And for those with limited English proficiency, that number drops to 35%. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, I skipped. Uh, I also wanna talk about looking at pop disaggregated populations in the county who have 24 months of post high school college education. We see disparities here too. 88% of white residents fit that criteria compared with 78% of black residents. 64% of Hispanic residents, and 86% of Asian residents. And this is where that statistic applies for those with limited English proficiency. 
that number of, with 24 months of post high school college drops to 35 percent. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the numbers in terms of political representation in the state and in the county. You know, historically, Maryland has been a leader in women's <coughs> representation at the state level, ranking first in the nation in 2006 for its concentration of women state legislators. But in the intervening years, Maryland has dropped to 10th in the nation on that metric and remains one of 20 states not to have elected a female governor. Following the 2018 election, 71 of the state's 188 legislators are women, 21 of whom were elected for the first time. One of the county's nine county council members is a woman, but women do hold all eight Board of Education seats and four of seven circuit court judgeships. A slightly greater percentage of women vote in the county when compared with men, 68% versus 64%. But we see some uh, voting disparities here too. In terms of voting <coughs> patterns, both uh, in Maryland and nationally, Asian and Hispanic citizens have notably lower voter turnout rates uh, than other races, 55% and 59% respectively, versus an average of 66%. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our findings around crime and public safety. Crime has fallen dramatically in the county by more than 40% in the last decade, which is great. But not all the trends we see on the public safety front are positive. Total reports of domestic violence increased by 38% from 2,203 to 3,040. And that's actually, I believe, not over a 10-year interval. They changed the way they collected that data, so I believe that is like over a three or four year period. Between 2016 and 2017, the percentage of rape cases increased 28% from 309 to 397 in the county. And law enforcement officials have speculated that this may be owing in part to greater public attention to the issue and increased willingness to report. In 2016, 50% of domestic violence victims in the state of Maryland were black, while 48% were white. And on an average day, about 9% of the population at the Montgomery County Correctional Facility is women. Next slide, please. So uh, I spent all my time really wanting to share, sorry, wanting to share the data that's available. And what I have done is I've skipped over entirely the recommendations that we made as a commission, uh, which will, you will find online and in the report. So I hope you will take a look at those. For those of you who aren't interested in taking a hard copy report, I'd encourage you to take a picture with your phones. That's the link that will take you to the full data dashboard, which has a much richer set of data than what I was able to talk to here. Uh, let's see, I think I've hit all the points that I wanted to share with you. You know, I will say that one of our recommendations in talking and thinking about racial disparities supports implementation of the county's equity policy framework. So I'd encourage you to take a closer look at the recommendations we're always open to suggestions as well, so if you have ideas for other suggestions we should be making as we study these things in detail and try and come up with policy prescriptions, uh, I would definitely encourage that. And on the next slide, you'll see my contact information and that of our executive director. So please feel free to reach out to either one of us if you have questions uh, or want to talk more about the data. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you tonight. I know I've thrown a lot at you in a short period, um, but it really has been a labor of love for us as a commission to be able to do this kind of work and present this kind of analysis, and we hope it will prompt positive changes in the years to come. Uh, thank you. Thank you. thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to hearing from you. Let's hope this behaves better. Thank you to the League of Women Voters, uh, Commissioner Tiffany. Is it Boynton? Boynton. Boynton. Thank you for those eye-popping statistics um, and for sharing them here in the Montgomery County level. I think that it's always important for us to understand the local context. Um, what I'm presenting is uh, more of a national uh, presentation. Uh, the data uh, comes from uh, the U.S. Census Bureau, and it was from a report. And by the way, um, just as way, by way of background, um, 
for a number of years, I co-led an initiative called the Closing the Racial Wealth Gap Initiative uh, in my role as uh, president of the Center for Global Policy Solutions, which uh, was a Washington, D.C.-based think tank. Now it's in Baltimore. Um, and the, um, the large funder for it was the Ford Foundation. It was our mission to highlight for policymakers, for the administration, for legislators, uh, for the media, uh, this issue of the racial wealth gap. Uh, we were talking at the time about uh, income uh, disparities and certainly uh, economic, uh, you know, the, the large gap between the haves and the have-nots in this country and, and widening gap. But no one was talking about the, um, the, the racial element uh, to it. And nobody was talking about the intersection of race, gender, and wealth. Uh, and so with that, we did a report called Beyond Broke, which got a lot of coverage um, some years ago. Uh, but this presentation is based on that, uh, that report. Uh, next slide, please. And so the Center for Global Policy Solutions um, is basically dedicated to making policy work for, policy, uh, policy work for um, people in their environments. But our focus is really on driving society toward inclusion, because we envision a society where everyone has an opportunity to live their best lives. Next slide, please. And in terms of the racial wealth gap, we really wanted to um, bring everyone's attention to the fact that it exists. Uh, this is a, a, a gap that is historically rooted. Um, a friend of mine says that basically, you know, this is, we literally have, we're walking around every day and we see each other on the streets. Uh, but literally, the difference in terms of what's in our pockets and what's in our bank accounts is historically rooted. Um, everyone knows, you know, I don't, on my, in my own family, I'm only the fourth generation from slavery on my mother's side. Um, and you might think that that's a historical footnote, but it has all kinds of um, implications in terms of whether or not, you know, you know, you got an inheritance, whether or not, you know, you come from a family that had any, anything to pass down. Uh, you know, to, you know, what the opportunities, your lifetime opportunities have been. Uh, and so literally, uh, we're structurally in this society, still living in a society where race makes a difference in terms of what's in your pocket. Now, I think that in terms of, you know, the last um, five to six decades, you know, since the civil rights era, you know, we've seen policies that have tried to actually address the systemic and structural factors. Uh, but we're now in an era where all of those things are, you know, the national environment is to roll these things back. Uh, even though we've never actually made great strides in terms of closing the gaps that got us here in the first place. So what I'm going to give you is what should be an interesting overview of, uh, of where we are and where we need to be. Next slide, please. So why are we focusing on wealth? I mean, you, you might say, you know, wealth is something that, uh, uh, that shouldn't be you know, we should focus on getting people a subsistence wage and making sure that they have a living wage and, uh, you know, why should we focus on wealth? Well, we focus on wealth because wealth, it, it, when you don't have an income coming in, uh, that's the cushion that you have uh, to lean back on when your income might disappear. It's also what you, you, what you use, you know, what people should be able to use uh, excess income for in terms of building assets that help provide them with that cushion during times of need. So most of us who have, you know, retirement funds or homes with equity or, you know, any other or, you know, investment accounts, uh, you know, we, we tend to think about our, these are assets that we have, but we don't even think about uh, what kinds of protections they provide us uh, in society. But those people that actually don't have wealth have no cushion. Uh, and so what we have been focused on for a number of years is not to just to educate people about the racial wealth gap, but also to focus on the need for asset building as a poverty alleviation strategy. That when you have assets, uh, that is something that can actually help to reduce poverty and provide that kind of support in times of need. Uh, emphasizing that there is an importance to not only private assets, because what I mentioned earlier uh, are those private assets, but public assets, things like Social Security that we tend to think of as, you know, um, a public asset, but we've been putting our wealth into it through our, um, through our payroll taxes, but that's an asset that people have as well. And then highlighting uh, the fact that there is an income gap that underlies all of this, and of course, leverage
leveraging data to target policy solutions. So the next slide, please. And well, um, oh, I'm sorry. I think I was behind. I, I'm, okay. Um, as you all well know, that there is a huge gap um, in terms of wealth uh, by race and ethnicity. Uh, and and you can hit it again. Oh wow! Back up. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I'll say this, that for every dollar of wealth held by the typical white family, uh, the typical African-American family now owns how much? Eight cents. 36. Who said eight cents? I was going to say that is for the typical Latino family. The typical African-American family owns seven cents. Oh my. So for every dollar of wealth held by the typical, owned by the typical white family, the typical African American family owns seven cents, and the typical Latino family owns eight cents. What's typical? That's I mean that's basically the average. Um, and so with that, you know the the fact of the matter is that we have these stark wealth disparities in our country. Um, and, and people need to understand why that is and also what we can do about it. But, next slide please. But, uh, coming out of the, um, you know, the, the, the big dip that we had in 2007, 2008 in terms of the, uh, the fact of the matter is that most uh, people of color, in fact, uh, the majority of people of color actually saw a steep decline uh, in their wealth, what wealth they, they, they did have prior to the Great Recession. Uh, and that is because most of it was actually um, tied up, of the wealth that they did have was tied up into their homes. Uh, and so you see here, um, you know, what the decline in home equity was uh, based on race and ethnicity. Uh, and you see that Latinos, Asians, and African Americans um, had a greater decline than did whites. Next slide, please. But get this, of the wealth that African Americans do hold, 92% of it is in homes. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it, uh, when you think about the impact of um, the mortgage crisis uh, and, 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 and those, all those exploding loans and the, the mortgages that were unsustainable and the home loss, et cetera, et cetera, African Americans had the greatest exposure to that because what wealth they did have was tied up into these homes. And we do know from the data that the, the, the mortgage brokers and the industry was actually targeting these uh, African American families especially, but uh, families of color uh, especially, and especially women headed households uh, for these faulty mortgage products, uh, causing them to have greater exposure to wealth loss uh, and so what we saw in our own lives uh, was basically wealth stripping uh, from these communities. Uh, and you see here uh, that that greater exposure, African Americans, Latinos, and Asians basically have uh, less diversification in terms of their portfolios, their wealth portfolios, and a lot of their um, wealth is tied up into homes. Next slide, please. Um, and then you see in terms of underwater mortgages in 2011, you saw that coming out of the Great Recession, uh, the African American households, Latino households, and slightly Asian households, but particularly African Americans and Latinos, had a higher percentage of underwater mortgages. Next slide, please. And then the home ownership rates, you know, have, um, you know, for, and, and the reason why this matters is because, you know, because you buy in the right neighborhoods at the right time, uh, you know, you have a, a whole lot of home equity, right? Um, and we know that whites have uh, historically had a higher uh, home ownership rate in this country. By the way, that was helped by policy, policy that was actually very discriminatory because, yes. you know, the Homestead Act uh, did not actually um, support uh, people of color. It went only to whites. Um, and I'm sorry, go ahead. Like FHA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a history of policies uh, in this country that have uh, basically discriminated against uh, African Americans particularly. And Nicole Williams, I forgot to highlight you. Thank you so much. This is my cousin, y'all. She's actually also the media guru. She's the media guru here tonight. Looking at her 
I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, for not acknowledging you up front. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is redlining. You've heard of redlining. Um, I mean, these were government-sponsored policies that were carried out by industry, upheld by industry pac uh, practices that systematically discriminated against um, people of color, African Americans especially, and undermined their ability and their right to own homes in this country and to be able to pay for them. Uh, on the flip side, we have policies that proactively helped to support white home purchasing. Um, and, and that was, you know, the uh, homes, you know, everything from the Homestead Act to uh, even the policies uh, of uh, coming out of um, uh, the, the soldiers who, the yes, VA, the, the VA yeah, the VA loans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you name it. Because it was, it was <coughs> given by the states, and the states <coughs> discriminated against people of color, didn't mm -hmm. give the funds the same way like Pennsylvania or, or where they would feel less discrimination on color. So it became regional and color and, the, and class. And the GI Bill, too. Yeah. So right. the VI, yeah. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Next slide, please. So here we have, so not just the history of slavery, we had ongoing discrimination taking place and, and being embedded in policy. Um, and so, you know, it bears out in terms of financial assets. You know, African Americans and Latinos have fewer financial, own fewer financial assets compared to Asians and whites. Next slide, please. And by the way, the data on Asians is not disaggregated. I'm sorry, what is going on? I don't know. Just... Oh my gosh. I think it had to do with the download. Okay. You know what? Uh, right. The, the, um, there was an error message when it downloaded that, okay. that it, it couldn't bring it all in. Okay, well, then that means I'm just going to have what? to talk to you. <laughs> right. I can what, do that. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I can do that. No problem. So, um, so what we have here is basically this history of discrimination that's living today in our pockets. But when we released this report, what I found interesting is that we took the data on Capitol Hill because we wanted to impress upon the policymakers that you can't just keep talking about income. We have to talk about wealth because that's the other side of the economic security equation. Mm -hmm. And if we're really talking about economic security for families, we should be talking about both. And so um, when I showed the stark statistics and the disparities, I had one congressman who is now a governor <laughs> who said, um, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, um, you know, poverty is poverty and you know, it doesn't matter if you're black or white, poverty is poverty. And then I had to flip a slide for him. <laughs> because I'm a data nerd too. And we had the data to show that poverty is not poverty for everybody. Poverty, even poverty is lived uh, substantially differently in this country. Uh, based on race and ethnicity. And, and what we showed in that slide that you would have saw is that the racial gap exists in every income quintile, but it is, um, it is highest at the lowest income quintile. So for, uh, so for every, um, so for poor, for the poorest um, whites, uh, Latinos, poor Latinos only have 7% of the wealth of poor whites. And African Americans have zero percent of the wealth of poor. Poor African Americans have zero percent of the wealth of poor whites. Now, do you understand what that means? No. Yeah. That means that literally, poor African Americans <coughs> have nothing to no. their name. That there is no cushion, nothing to lean back on. Um, and so, you know, poverty is. I mean, the you know, it's just. Um, you know, there's just um, just a stark difference in, even in terms of how poverty is experienced in this country. Uh, and so what we've got is a major problem. Um, Tiffany mentioned, Commissioner Tiffany, excuse me, uh, mentioned that um, African American women uh, are more likely to be single heads of households. That is true all across this country. Uh, and it's, and it's shaped by any number of things, including the incarceration rates, uh, including, you know, you know, a whole bunch of factors. Um, but, you know, African American women uh, tend to actually be heads of households. And when we break the down this data around the wealth gap by race and gender, uh, it shows that African American women with children, do you want to guess what their wealth is? 
Is that, yeah, zero. It's actually zero. Uh, because there are many that have negative wealth, meaning that they're in debt. Uh, and then African American women, if you look at it in a more aggregate without um, the, they're breaking it out by children, uh, it's $200 compared to, I think, $17,000 for white women. Uh, and so what we see here is, I mean, just desperation when it comes to economics. And it's all hooked up into policy. And so when we're talking about the nature of the solutions, we actually have to look at policy too. Yes, closing that wage gap is incredibly important. So for every dollar owned by uh, or earned by um, a white male, uh, African Americans and Latinos uh, earn 68 cents. Um, and it's more stark for women of color, and you heard what it means for Latina women here in the county. Um, so we've got to, if we're, you know, if we're working for institutions that are paying minimum wage, if we're going to restaurants that are paying sub-minimum wage, do you know that many of these restaurant workers, these tipped workers, do not get minimum wage? Do not get minimum wage. And the debate about this is being fought right now in Annapolis with regards to the $15 fight for 15. And the restaurant industry is out in full force trying to actually fight the ability of restaurant workers, tip workers, to get a minimum wage. I mean, this is happening in our faces, under our noses. And that disproportionately, those workers are women of color disproportionately. So we've got a situation where we, you know, either attend or patronize institutions uh, where workers who are a very low wage are, are, are not getting, I think, their due, and that's due to policy. Um, and so we've got to pay attention. These are our fights. Because when a woman with children is earning some minimum wage levels, and she's having to find two and three jobs just to try to make ends meet. She's not able to be there for her children. You know, her children are fending on their own probably and not being able to, um, you know, uh, get the best from their, uh, from a parent that they need to be fully supported in school. Uh, not having the support that they need to, you know, for transportation. The women not having the support that they need across the board. It makes no sense. We're cutting our noses off to spite our faces. And we should and could be doing better. So labor policy is incredibly important for this. But so are policies like um, the assets I talked about earlier. And Social Security is a big one. Because you can work a lifetime at low wages. Uh, and if you're not working in the right jobs, if you don't work in the jobs that actually come with, did you, how many of you know that approximately half of American workers do not work in a job where they get tax preferred retirement benefits. Now I bet you all of you. Okay. You I, know, did, I have never. You've never worked in a job where you got retirement benefits. Never. Right. Most of you have. Where you get a 401k or a 403b, all those fancy little numbers. Mm -hmm. um, or if you really, if you work for a county government, you got, you still got a, um, what do you call it? Defined benefit plan. Yep. Where you got so we got a guy up here who has one. They're trying to go by the way of the dinosaur, but that's the best plan. Yes. It is. Because it's you know it's not dependent upon the stock market. Mm -hmm. You know they guarantee you vest in, and then they guarantee you an amount uh, once you vest uh, for as long as you live. That's a good deal. <laughs> but guess what? There are private actors. Um, some of the some of the Enron people have set up a foundation where they're actually affirmatively going after, they're seeking to undermine um, these defined benefit uh, plans, to turn them into defined contribution plans, which are the stock market, the 401k kind of plans. Uh, the problem with that is that they're not secure. Once the stock market goes south, you can, your, your plans can be wiped out. And it might be right before retirement. And what do you do then? And then there's the issue of Social Security. And I am not going to get part of some League of Women Voters, but I am going to say this, that <laughs> Social Security has been perennially under threat, not by Democrats, but by Republicans. And we've got a situation where we've got to pay attention to these, and, and I consider Social Security as a part of, a, a essential part of the safety net. 
uh, because here we had the poor side as a nation, and we had to do it after the pain of the Great Depression where we had the foresight of a nation to say that we don't want our older people who have given a lifetime of work to actually have to uh, retire forcibly because they can no longer work with nothing to fall back on. There was a time in our country prior to 1935 where you could work for as many years as you could work and then your body gave out. And if you didn't have family members to take you in, you were literally begging for alms literally begging for alms. And so we said we were better than that as a nation and that we would create social security and make workers and employers pay into a system that would guarantee a guaranteed income for life for people who retired after a lifetime of work. And, and then we added on and said we would provide disability benefits for workers who became disabled in their uh, prime of life. We added on and said we provide survivor benefits uh, for the, so it's a, also a life insurance benefit. So if a worker dies and leaves dependents behind, Social Security kicks in and provides a benefit for them. So, I mean, we have policies that we have to protect because these policies are incredibly important and they're public assets. They're things that belong to us. Your money goes into it. Don't let them tell you that it's an entitlement that you're not entitled to. That is yours. And that's a big battle that will continue to come up because the the, the pattern is, is that they come in, they give themselves a big tax cut, which like they just did uh, a year and a half ago, and then they say, oh my gosh, the, def and the deficit is huge, and we can no longer afford Social Security and Medicare. And then they come in and say, time to slash benefits, time to privatize Social Security. It's a ruse. Don't ever fall for it. Because what they're trying to do is basically send the public dollars we send into public uh, social security and send it into private pockets so that they can get rich off of our money. And, and, then, and then the security that we currently get from the programs will be eliminated. So, I mean, better education, better wages, better, you know, making sure we're protecting our social insurance structure. I mean, these are all the kinds of policies that we need. Uh, you know, on the mortgage side, we need to do better about, you know, it is possible for lower income people to actually purchase homes sustainably, but we didn't do that in terms of the crisis. Uh, there are ways to do it. We need to get better at it through policy. There are still people who are harmed, stuck in, they're, they're stuck and frozen into mortgages uh, that are too high and unsustainable. They kept paying. We need to have relief for those folks. There are all kinds of things that need to happen. So with that, you know, I think that we're going to have an engaging discussion. I look forward to joining Tiffany up here for, uh, I think, a, a conversation that, uh, that will start with their questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Beyond Broke, in addition to Against the Odds, you also have Beyond Broke. Yes. So they go together, because one is very focused on Montgomery County and parallels a lot of what's happening in Maryland and nationally. So I'm going to open it up for questions for either person. Just raise your hand. Yeah. I just, a general uh, um, discussion question is the difference between urban poverty and rural poverty. And we have that in Montgomery County. We don't... Um, the new uh, gentleman who's in charge of uh, public health has a lovely um, presentation on data. And we find in Montgomery County some of our forest health indicators are up county in the more rural areas of the county. And so um, would you like to talk about the difference between um, like down county urban poverty? I'll give this one to Commissioner Women, to see if you, you can talk a little bit, because you know Montgomery County data a lot more intimately. <laughs> and I should remind everyone, this is my volunteer gig and not my day job, so uh, my memory on some of this is a little spotty. Um, if there is information, we do do some analysis in the report that does um, drill down by geographic area, and I think it is on the poverty information, but I don't know it offhand, so I would refer you to a link to take a look at the data dashboard because some of it is broken out geographically. I mean, I, I think to your point, we could probably reason that, uh, again, some of those poverty indicators and health indicators 
sometimes do, do look worse in, in some of the rural counties, but, but I also think uh, where you get pockets of deep poverty in urban areas, you know, they, they probably don't look so very different. I, I would just say, so first of all, let me just give you a background. My folks come up from a very rural, small town. Um, and even though my life was very different from the way they grew up, um, because my dad ended up joining the Air Force, and I spent basically all of my formative years living on or near military bases across the country, even abroad. Um, they grew up in a very small, poor town uh, in West Texas. And to give you a sense of, uh, the median income of that town is $22,000. Median, uh, and um, the population now is just shy of 1,500. And so, you know, we always spent our summers um, going to visit. And they grew up; they were childhood sweethearts heart who grew up next door to each other. So we'd go home to visit the grandmas and the grandpas, and they lived right next door to each other. We would run between the two houses. But I remember one of my grandmothers getting indoor plumbing in 1978. I remember that. When she, my, my, my father and his brothers installed her indoor plumbing, and they were able to hook it up to the county line that had just been actually extended out to their, their neck of the woods, which was a segregated neighborhood where the, you know, there was still dirt roads on the black side of town, and it was on the other side of the tracks. I grew up with stories of my parents telling me what it was like to grow up in the Jim Crow South, not being able to walk in the front doors of stores and having to sit in the segregated parts of the movie theaters where the black kids were uh, designated to go. But I say all that to say that when I go back there, I know that it's a trek, that they have to pull their resources. You know, a lot of them actually have health challenges. Um, but the nearest um, facility for, you know, for example, for, for them to get their dialysis uh, is 60 miles away. And so they have to create their own little carpool situation to get to, to make their, um, needs and the health wise. Um, there's now a Walmart that's 60 miles away. Uh, there's no longer a town, I mean a, a grocery store right there in town. They have to go, I mean, and so the, the costs of tr uh, transportation, the challenges presented by transportation, uh, the fact that, you know, the resources are not immediately accessible. Uh, my own grandmother ended up passing away because she didn't have immediately um, available accessibility um, of, of health care. So, I mean, there are just different kinds of challenges. The experience is different. Now, in the inner city, where I live now in Baltimore, <laughs> and literally when my husband says, you might have seen him talk, he says, we live in the inner, inner, inner city. <laughs> that is absolutely correct. Um, and so on a daily basis, we see the challenges of drug addiction. Uh, we see the challenges of living in a city that has um, segregated um, lines in terms of uh, where low-income people live and where wealthier people live, and segregated investments in terms of what the city actually does on one side of town versus what the city does on the other side of town. Um, there is a disparity in terms of uh, investments in economic development. Uh, the, and as a result, you see a disparity in terms of the schools, the condition of the schools, and then the product that's developed out of the schools. Uh, and so what you have is, by design, uh, you have an entire group of people that are starved of resources uh, and, um, and where the condition of poverty uh, creates a cycle of other conditions that actually bring people down. Uh, and so I would say that ex while the, the, the economic profile might not be different in terms of statistics, the experiences, I think, are, are, are very different. Cummings, what would you recommend for residents of Montgomery County to begin to address this? I realize it's a grain of sand given the need, but what would you recommend? So, from what I'm hearing, and, and you know, I've been I've been out and about here now. Um, so I've been in the DMV area since 1997, and I spent the first 10 years living actually in the district. Um, and then, you know, moved, got married and moved to Baltimore. Um, but for the last two years, I've been coming down to Montgomery County frequently. And, and what I hear is that there are pockets of, um, of, of, of 
exclusion and need in Montgomery County. Uh, and you can almost track it um, in terms of, you know, economic development, et cetera, et cetera, like I talked about earlier. So I would recommend that when we're talking about a development plan for the, the area, that equity, equity, equity should drive everything that you do. Um, I would say that, you know, and you need economic development in order to promote jobs and opportunities and a tax base uh, in areas that have been historically, for whatever reason, neglected. And Burtonsville, I think, is an area that I hear a lot, and also what's another area? Um, Langley Park. Langley Park. Okay. So, I mean, what, I'm sorry? Montgomery Village. Okay. So I'm assuming that these are older uh, corridor areas with older housing stock, um, perhaps a lack of, a no economic development plan or um, an insufficient one, um, and, and that, um, that there needs to be, um, and in terms of educational institutions, I would hate to think that Montgomery County actually doesn't invest as much in those school systems as it does in the other areas of the state, but those are the questions you have to ask because an equity strategy means this. Equity is not just about providing equal resources. It's actually providing, it's about providing sufficient resources to meet the need and the deficit. So that might mean that you might have to pour more resources into those areas that need more uh, because that's the strategy for actually bringing everybody up to a similar par. Um, and so I would say it needs to be equity, equity, equity on transportation, on economic development, and on uh, uh, definitely on schools. And I do think, um, I mean, as a Montgomery County parent with kids in the public schools, I mean, in terms of public education, you know, they are trying to do some things differently. I, I'll give you one example. Um, the way that they now make decisions around uh, admission to the gifted and talented program, they've started taking into account factors other than just test scores uh, and really trying to give a leg up to kids whose parents might not be uh, as savvy or have the time to kind of navigate that system. So, so there's some things that are promising uh, in terms of trying to create that equity for every student. Mm -hmm. One place where it one place where it might fall down though is on after school support. Um, I'm thinking of South Lake Elementary in Montgomery Village. That's the only one I know. But that's possibly one area where there's a problem. Any other yeah. Who knows where the works best? The research I've seen in the Arab databases argue that every classroom should be a gifted and talented classroom. And when I talk to some of the superintendents in the county, it was always very difficult to get the per pupil spending between the magnet schools and the rest of the population. And anytime I attempted to broach what that research argued, and the outcomes in that research document that regardless of the SES, putting the students in that gifted and talented, hands-on, resources-oriented, low student-teacher ratio, the outcomes were very much the same. And it always frustrates me when they talk about the education gap because we really have some of the solutions to closing it, but they won't spend the money on every child. I don't know. If Either one of you can address that reluctance in terms of the definition of equity. Well, I'm happy to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to talk about it from the person grounding it in my own experience. So I, I have always been, because I grew up in a household where my mother was a voracious reader. I mean, I was born in a library. So, I mean, I've always been, I think, good at. English and language, etc. But don't ask me about math. <laughs> and so, you know, so coming up, um, there was tracking in the schools, right? Where um, I would be invited to actually go to the gifted um, English class, but I was in the regular class <laughs> on math and everything. But there was a difference in treatment. 
the kids in the regular classes were not, they were not told or taught or expected to go to post-secondary education. Mm -hmm. They were never, college was never mentioned. Um, it was a substantively, even though we might have been in the same high school, it was a substantively different experience in terms of expectations and in terms of support and in terms of any, even planning for post high school um, uh, opportunities as compared to being in that gifted class where the expectation was higher. So I say that to say that um, what's happening is that when you're denying and, um, and assuming that black kids and Latino kids do, are not gifted because of your presumptions about their abilities being shaped by stereotype, uh, when what we know uh, is that the distribution of intelligence is, is you know, pretty similar across groups. That means that we're leaving talent on the table. And not only that, but we're also presuming and assuming and picking and choosing uh, who's smart and who's not at very early ages. And who's deserving of those opportunities at very early ages and, and just leaving talent on the table left and right. We actually have to do better. We have to do better by all of our kids, and we have to have the expectation that they have uh, the right choices um, uh, and supports that they need to, to live their best lives and to reach their highest potential. Well, I'm gonna actually turn it back to, to you, because you pointed out this, about the disparity in post-secondary uh, school education. Right. Do you want to go back to it just a second and sure. say something? Uh, well, and I think also this issue of <coughs> the high numbers of disconnected youth in the county, that mm -hmm. we need to be doing more to um, support kids <coughs> in thinking about what comes next after high school uh, and, and helping them get there, uh, whether that is um, a vocational technical program. Um, I work at the Department of Labor as my day job, starting to do a lot to think about apprenticeship, uh, you know, traditional four-year, whatever that's going to be, what we can do uh, here as a municipality and as a state to support kids in preparing for, for that next step is important. And there is discrimination in counseling. <laughs> because I don't know how many people I have talked to, including myself, um, who have experienced a counselor who just looked at you and presumed that you were not college material. Um, you know, even though in high school I had the, the honors English on my, and I had a pretty good GPA, I walked into my counselor's office and she was just basically like, you know, she had no expectations for me. Um, and my husband, uh, you know, he was told at a very, he, he was, he was actually tracked into a special ed class. <laughs> and when he told his, his, his person that he wanted to be a lawyer, the lawyer looked at him and said, who do you think you are? You know, you're the son of laborers. Why do you think that you can be a lawyer? And, and we know what happened to Congressman Cummings. <laughs> and so what we have are people making assumptions about um, people's worth and their talent and whether they're deserving and undeserving based on you know, all kinds of stereotypes. And we need to do a better job overall uh, in making sure that not only those options are there, but the counseling is quality. And that the kids don't get the message that it's true. Because for some people, they overcome the odds for one reason or another. They're able to overcome the odds. But for so many kids, they believe it's true. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, I'm more curious about uh, mental health disparities in African American uh, women and um, they disproportionately utilize emergency room services than preventive care. And I'm interested to know what are some of the contributing factors. Um. I think that's a great question and I'll add to it. Has it changed since the Affordable Care Act? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, rates of uninsurance uh, in the state and in the county have definitely dropped since the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, for sure. But, but when you talk about these disparities, 
uh, in terms of preventative care versus emergency room. I mean, I mean that probably is owing in part to access to uh, health insurance. And you know, I was I, in one of my million statistics that I threw at you. Uh, you know, more than half of the uninsured folks uh, in Maryland are Hispanic. So, so there are these racial and ethnic disparities in access to, to health insurance and the ability um, to access preventative care. So in terms of the Affordable Care Act, um, we did a study that showed that um, after the Affordable Care Act was passed, the rate of uninsured went down for every population group. Um, so for you know women of color, for men of color, for white people, et cetera. Um, yet at the same time, the issue of affordability and how you access your care is still very real. And so women of color are disproportionately um, uh, in, on Medicaid um, and uh, the affordability of care um, uh, matters uh, for those who aren't on Medicaid, right? Um, and so historically, the disproportionate accessing of the emergency room services, I think, has absolutely been tied to insurance and affordability. Um, while that might have changed with the Affordable Care Act, um, the fact of the matter is it's still a disproportionate experience uh, for those who still don't have access. Um, and so you see it in the statistics. But get this, do you know who the, the fastest declining um, life expectancy is for in this country now? It's white males. Mm -hmm. It's white women. Without, with, with a high school degree or less, closely followed by white men with a high school degree or less. And so what we're experiencing in this country is a confluence of events around um, uh, the, um, the opioid epidemic, uh, the situation of joblessness, uh, the desperation that comes, and that's traditionally been something that people of color have experienced and coped with. But now we've got a whole new group of folks who are experiencing and not coping very well with the situation. And it's being reflected in terms of a decline in life expectancy. In the United States of America, the richest country on the planet. So we've got, we've got challenges and we've got work to do. Well, certainly the opioid crisis is more located in the white community than it is in any other. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, well, in their own pockets. I mean, you come from Baltimore, too. So in the Baltimore area. But there's, there are, at the higher proportions are in our white, in our white. So it's always yeah. been apparent in the, in the African American um, we just never named it a crisis. Um, and so once it started hitting the white community, all of a sudden it became a crisis and it became a policy priority that it never was before. So this is the discrimination in policy and the public's awareness that, that we're, you know, that we have. This is one example. Yeah, correct. Yeah. 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 Well, the difference between crack and, and other and power is another issue. He's waiting for one. Thank you. We're going to talk about equity and policy. And I, if we were in a much younger group, I think certain things would come up, like free college and, um, and redistribution of wealth. And I wonder, which means taxes, which gets to taxes. And I'm wondering, even in the group that we have assembled here, how many people are willing to up their taxes? Because don't we need to face doing that? And we are uh, the most under, I mean, uh, among, we're undertaxed compared to most uh, developed countries. But people, I mean, you can't bring it up. And if you bring up things like Medicare for all and free college, um, you're going to get called a socialist and forget about it. <laughs> but the young people aren't forgetting about it. They're talking about it more and more. If you've got my grandchildren together, they're in the DSA. <laughs> and they, 
they don't see, and there's an article about England on the front page of the New York Times today about <coughs> young people there looking at socialism not as a dirty word. I'm just speaking as a parent, but Maryland did recently pass a law that provides uh, tuition-free college for families under $150,000 um, at our community colleges throughout the state. Um, my daughter's a senior at Einstein, and we just went down to Montgomery College in Silver Spring to get her signed up filled out the FAFSA and everything. So that resource is there, and whether you call it socialism or not, mm -hmm. um, we are moving in the right direction on that front here in Maryland. So, so I, I think that it's important to talk about how they're rigging the tax code. Because they just rigged the tax code, um, and they've done it twice over the last two and a half years. And, and now you're seeing all these stories on the front page of the Washington Post and the, um, talking about how people are going to get their tax refunds and finding, oh my God, my refund is not the same as it was before. And that is because they rigged it this time around uh, to make sure that where the middle class are basically paying more out. While these wealthy corporations are walking away with zero tax liability and some are getting refunds, and wealthy, wealthy individuals are, are experiencing the same thing. They have rigged it to their benefit. And they are at the same time, while they're rigging it to the, when I say they, I'm talking about the wealthy interests in this country. And I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about uber wealthy people who have weighed in and they have uh, influenced this tax code and the people who have worked on their behalf in the Congress uh, to create a situation where uh, where, you know, there are all kinds of advantages. People who have unearned income, you know, they're not paying the same rates on their, on their taxes. And, they, and they're not even being taxed, for example, for Social Security on unearned income. I mean, this is stuff that, where the, these are the disparities that are baked into the tax code. Uh, they've got all kinds of benefits to subsidize where the people, you and I, and I know none of you are uber wealthy in this room, I think, <laughs> but where we're subsidizing their lifestyle through tax benefits for all kinds of things like private planes and yeah. you name it. And so when it comes to the needs of the people and meeting the needs of the people, I have no I have no qualms in saying, you know, let's let's roll back some of that stuff you just all of these favors you just gave yourself. Let's roll back some of these things because guess what? You don't even need it. This is pure simple greed. Um, and, and if we're talking about it, in the, in the, the fact of the matter is that, you know, we have to be focused on um, tax, the tax code is a major way uh, where they reverse engineer how the resources should flow. So we have to pay attention to it, it's important. Um, and on the back end of that, you know, what are the investments we need to make? Uh, and yes, education is one of them, um, you know, healthcare is another of them. You know, transportation is another. Um, renewable energy sources is another. I mean, we have things that we need to do in this country in order to make it uh, basically a thriving, growing economy that works for everyone. Actually, not quite, but um, <laughs> I, most of it. <laughs> um, I, I guess I just want to quickly say something about the English NHS system, in that I kind of defend the NHS a lot, being British. I've lived here for 10 years, so I've kind of had a, a couple of kids here and a, a good sense of how the system is different. And I always say to people, you know, a system for everybody requires that everybody gets a 10-year-old Chevy and nobody gets a Porsche. Mm -hmm. And when you apply that at the population level, it works great. But if I say to you, well, you can't get your expensive immuno-oncology drug, sorry, it's too expensive. When it's your mom or your <coughs> granny, people don't want to accept that. And the realistic, you know, the realism is that these drugs are too expensive to pay for everybody. Like, the level of healthcare that ensure people get here is just not sustainable across the whole population. 
And so I really think that, for me personally, I would prefer that everybody gets a 10-year-old Chevy, and I, I might need something I can't get, and that's, that's the situation in England. So I think we have to be realistic about you're not going to get the quality of care you get here for everybody without increasing taxes in an amount that's not feasible. At the same time, I studied abroad. I, I went to um, Holland and studied abroad, and I got sick while I was over there. I walked into a facility and got care and walked out, and <laughs> that was it. And that does happen in the UK for like acute emergent care, but it's the thing, the chronic diseases with the really expensive drugs, and as immuno-oncology comes forward, and I, I work in, I'm a health economist, so I kind of work know more about the drug side than devices and the like. I mean, these things are hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and you need them every single day. So the more they work, the longer you pay for them and the more the overall cost And we know is rationing is a, is a part. Um, at the same time, the fact of that having that access, everybody having access is incredibly important. Absolutely. So the question is trade-offs. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the big issues here that I see from like an immigrant perspective is that a lot of these these laws are set by wealthy white older people and they're the people that need the amino oncology drugs in, in general. And so, you know, you're kind of asking people to, to think about themselves and their peers and say, well, I might not make it and so that other people can have can have something at the kind of a lower level and that's I don't know, it's not something that people like to hear when they put it in the context of their own family, but that is the reality in, in the UK. Anyway, I don't know about mm -hmm. Colin. So my question has to do with the census. I was recently in um, DC and, and um, at a disability conference, and they were saying that the census <coughs> is, is going to be really bad in 2020 because they've not funded it correctly. Um, it's going to be the first time online, and it's, it's not going to be as accurate as it can be. So in concern of that, how, how do you think that the projections of everything that you laid out tonight, how can you follow up honestly about are we doing better or worse, or what, what can we do about the census and make it accurate? So this is another rigging of the system, OK? <laughs> this is another rigging of the system, because, and I'm sorry to the women voters, <laughs> but the, the, the current administration is in charge of setting the rules for the census. And they've been doing things to, um, and that's not a, it wasn't a democratic administration. Um, and they've been doing things to actually rig the census to actually have a deliberate undercount. Um, the, the whole question of citizenship that they were seeking to insert was deliberately trying to um, put the fear of God into Latinos uh, so that they don't even try to fill out a form. Um, and anybody else who um, might not have status uh, in this country, which automatically depresses your turnout. Um, the fact that you know they're going online, another depression of the turnout. I, I will never forget when we were doing the sign-ups for the Affordable Care Act in, in, uh, in Baltimore. Uh, there was a line of people at a high school. They were wrapped around uh, the, the basement of a high school. Uh, waiting in line to have somebody help them to fill out their forms. There was only a bank of maybe 10 computers. And I noticed that there were two computers sitting empty. And then the lady called out and she said, anybody in this line can go straight to the front if they actually want to do their own, if they want to um, use a computer themselves to actually sign themselves up. Nobody moved. They didn't know how to use the computer. And so what we're talking about is also another depression automatically of people who are not going to go online and to do, um, you know, that don't have necessarily the skills it takes to actually fill out and complete the census online. That's another depression factor. So what we're seeing here, and, that, and all that works for the benefit of, of, of people who know the kinds of people that don't have the technical skills, uh, who are, you know, perhaps not uh, scared about their citizenship status and, or getting found out. Uh, and those tend to be people who are concentrated in areas that traditionally vote Democrat. And those undercounts will actually probably disproportionately hurt urban areas. They'll disproportionately hurt, you know, those areas um, where these people reside, which then helps the other side um, in terms of resources and the distribution of resources that counts for how are you redistricting? I noticed that was an issue for you all. I mean, it's going to help them. 
to have an undercount, and it's sad. But we've reached a point where we have, I think, one major party in this country that is their only principle that they follow is the principle of maximum political advantage. Well, I'm interested in what you think of the new uh, county executives' uh, programs or promises concerning any of these topics you talked about today. <laughs> And I'll try and talk loud. Um, right. So uh, the Montgomery County Commission for Women, we are an agency of government. And, and so as such, um, a particular our leadership has pretty routine interaction with the county executive. Um, and, and we talked with his office quite a lot in preparing to go public with this report. Um, and, and we were actually pretty pleased with his willingness to um, you know, we, we dithered a lot about the title, A Tale of Two Counties, where we really did want to hold up the fact that there are big disparities, that not everyone is doing well, and we weren't really too sure how that was going to be received by a new county executive. Um, but he was actually kind of quite willing to let us tell what we thought was the story. So, so I, I think that's pretty promising in terms of his willingness to kind of look down the barrel of, of some of these problems uh, and, and try and develop solutions to, to address them. Well, does he have any particular programs, or has he promised programs that fit your recommendations, fit your level of concerns? Well, some of them were things that were existing already, like the equity framework, um, which I think they have every intention of, of continuing. Um, so I wouldn't want to speak too much to particular plans that they have as they ramp up. Um, but I think there's a pretty good uh, kind of scaffolding already in the county for, for them to continue. Uh, good, good evening, my name is Mayu. Um, thank you ladies for your talk, we, I really appreciate it. My question revolves around student loans. So, younger generation So, I guess I have two questions re regarding that. Um, I can speak from personal experience, uh, millennials and Generation X, I think sometimes the hindrances to building wealth is the fact that we're considering the burden that we have in repaying back our student loans. So my question to you is, um, have you guys done research around how that influences um, certain generations? And second, are there any policies that are being formulated in order to lighten the load of, you know, people trying to, that are burdened with um, student loans and are trying to build wealth. Um, one hindrance that I can testify to that is um, um, younger generations that are trying to start businesses, a lot of the hindrance into going to start businesses, especially if they cannot get VC funded, is that they wouldn't do it. They'll rather seek employment that offers them instant income as opposed to anything else. Okay, so student loan debt has swelled to $1.4 trillion, surpassing total amount of credit card debt that Americans hold. Wow. So literally, student loan debt is, is driving and a, a depressing um, the, the life opportunity of, of the young, the millennials and the younger generations. Um, so yes, um, and the um, Elizabeth Warren has a bill out, um, and what does it do? That's a good question. Um, Student Loan Refinancing Act, and it would allow those with outstanding debt, loan debt, to refinance at the interest rates offered to new federal bar borrowers. Uh, I guess it's a lower rate. I've seen some who say that the federal government should actually offer a 0% interest rate in terms of student loans. Um, there are several proposals that are out there. None of them have, I think, moved in a major way, but they've been um, an issue that have been, it's been continuously coming up in terms of how to address this. In terms of the effect on uh, millennials and the, what's the generation below millennials? Generation X. I have seen data that shows that we now have the first generation of of millennials who do not have the comparable uh, progression of economic 
security that their parents did at that age. Meaning that, um, that we are raising the, the, a generation of young people who will not actually surpass their parents in terms of uh, the, the, the level of economic <coughs> security that they reached. Um, so, and then a lot of that is due to um, the, the, the debt crisis. Um, and other factors like um, you know, the, the impact of the Great Recession on the, the kids that were, or the young people that were just coming into the labor market at that time and not having the opportunities. So, um, and that is frankly creating a crisis across the, the because you know, they're not purchasing homes, Mm -hmm. um, they're not having the required savings that it'll take to retire, you know, and so what we're seeing is a ricochet effect. And then the student loans, to add it all, to, to add insult to injury, are not dischargeable. Mm -hmm. So literally, I mean, this is a debt that will follow you to your grave. <laughs> Um, and, and beyond, and and beyond, beyond actually. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> federal loans, um, I think, are forgiven if you die. But and, and they can loans. even they can even deduct it from your social security check. Mm -hmm. um, so those student loan debtors, I mean, even you know, are going after any way they can to get their money back. So literally, so we have a crisis in this country, and it's fueled by the the increasing cost of higher education. Uh, it's fueled by you know how we structure the loan. Uh, market, uh, but policies are are being looked at and pursued. It's up to young people to agitate. It's up to everybody to agitate to actually get this burden off of uh, the shoulders of young people. First, they have to vote. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and make the priority. Hello. There's a young person. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, I'm a student with UMBC at Shady Grove University. I'm studying history. And um, I was really inspired by you, Dr. Cummings, and what you just explained, the history and, and um, the racial history and everything. And it's, it's sad to learn that people don't know about it and the effects of it. Um, and I'm also an immigrant, first generation immigrant, South Asian. And you, were, you did a slide on the Asians. And I want to know like why they have the highest and if it's correlated, and I notice a lot of Asians vote Republicans, and I don't know if it has to do with their, <coughs> the way their family values are, or like if they didn't face discrimination. I don't know, I mean, I'm just looking into that. So thank you, because I think that- Could you stand up or use the mic or vote? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I think I was about to explain that yeah. when the slides went out. Um, but basically, that's aggregated Asian data. And, every, and any, any expert on uh, Asian data will tell you that you have to disaggregate to understand that there are certain populations of Asians who do excess, exceedingly well. And I think that that's um, Chinese, uh, those of Chinese origin and um, uh, perhaps India. But if you look at, um, you know, Laotians or, you know, other population groups, Hmong, uh, other population groups, their wealth status and their income status tracks closely to that experience by Latinos and African Americans, just very, very, very um, indigent or lower, um, lower economic um, opportunities uh, in terms of wealth and in terms of income. So what you see in the aggregate data is a skewing of one population of Asians who are doing exceedingly well, and then others who aren't doing so well, and is hiding their data. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, what was the, the question you asked me? Like why are they doing so much better compared to other ethnicity? What is that? So I, I think that you would see that, so I think that you would see that some of those <laughs> groups are become of the professional class, um, you would see that some of them are, you know, the tech sector or, you know, doctors and lawyers or whatever. Um, you will also see that you asked this question about why they vote Republican. Yeah. Many are business owners, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is a myth in this country that, you know, you can't be a business owner and also be a Democrat. <laughs> um, that, you know, that Republicans are the party of business owners. And, and our business, and that you're of a certain class, then the brand is that Republic, the Republican Party is for you. 
Um, so I think that I think that the response to that kind of branding, it might not be the reality in terms of their situation, um, but the branding is such that they, you know, perhaps support that party because of it. That's my theory. <laughs> Well, and first of all, I want to thank you both very, very much. This is one of the wisest of the And I believe when voters, you want to make sure you have a copy of our elected and a copy of the League of Women Voters scarf. Now, the scarf, the prototype for the scarf was done 60 years ago, right, Diane? And, right? Yes. Or more? And we are now celebrating our, we have celebrated our 99th year, the wow. League of Women Voters Montgomery County.